Coaster Kings Radio. All right, welcome everyone to our first episode of the Coaster Kings Radio. My name is Sean. I'm here with Alex, Nick, and Sven. We're going to be talking uh, about ourselves for a little bit, and then um, hopefully you guys enjoy the show. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Alex. Uh, I'm from Santa Cruz, California. Uh, I'm Nick. I'm from Orlando, Florida. And I'm Sven, and I'm from Europe, from Belgium. <laughs> And, of course, I'm Sean. We recently moved to Orlando. Uh, you probably know me from California, Coaster Kings, where we started. And now we are Orlando-based. So the overall brand, thecoasterkings.com, which we launched a couple weeks ago, is now Orlando-based with um, correspondents in California, Florida, and Europe. So we're going to kind of go through some questions to kind of get to know everyone better. Uh, the first question that we have is, like, what is your top five coasters? A nice little introduction. Oh, I get to go first? Okay. You get to go first. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, number one coaster is Lightning Rod, obviously, because I'm basic. Uh, number two, Wood Coaster at uh, Night Valley in Shenzhen, China, because that's me trying to counterbalance my basicness of my first answer. Uh, number three, Bullet Coaster, which is also in China. It's the, one of those uh, SNS compressed air launch coasters. The number four is Trod. Which is also in China. Are you noticing a theme here? Um, and then number five is the Giant Dipper in Santa Cruz, because that's my baby. That's where I'm from. That's my everything. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my top five. So my number one coaster is still Vengeance. Um, that's probably even more basic answer than yours. <laughs> I've been upstaged. I know. Sorry. <laughs> our, our RMCs are winning here. RMC yeah, yeah. basicness. Love that ride. That ride blew me away. Um, Got out of my list. Uh, number two, and these are in no particular order from now on. So number two, one of my favorite rides is Magnum XL 200. Um, I absolutely love that classic arrow ride. It's just it's so much fun. It's it's, it's classic. Um, Fury 325 also up there on my top five. And then bringing it back down to Florida, uh, Mako and Kumba round out my list. Uh, I love Mako. It was my first B&M hyper. Uh, it's just it's a smooth, great ride. And then Kumba. Kumba's just. It's what B&M used to do. It's, it's just they're in their fullest form. It's, yeah. it's a great ride. It's a textbook. Yeah, saying. so first <laughs> notice is that I haven't ridden any of those coasters yet. So we love you, There's though. still a lot for me to do. Um, and let me do it the other way around to build up the suspense, you know. I'm going to start with my number five, which is Lek Coaster at uh, Legendia in Poland. Vekoma is back, baby. Yeah, uh, I was so surprised by it. It's like small, and yet it, that, bec it's because of that that the elements are so much fun. It must be like my most watched POV currently, because I'm just yeah. obsessed with that ride. I think that's our number one most sought after credit that we don't have. Yeah, that's one. my bucket list, number that's one. That's our number one bucket list. And then Gravity Max yeah. is the number two. I've already read Well, it, so. Poland is uh, <laughs> definitely a destination that you have to do now for coasters because Energylandia is also becoming the new Cedar Point in Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the Cedar Point in Europe or Six Flags Magic Mountain, whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'm always like, don't get your hopes up too high because then you might be disappointed. But nevertheless, that coaster is very good. Um, my number four is Nemesis at Alton Towers. It was one of my first uh, inverted coasters from B&M, and so far, it's still my favorite. I rewrote it just last year, and uh, I love the new paint job, and it's still running smooth after all these years, so yeah, Nemesis is really, it needs to be in my top five. I feel like that's um, a bucket list for Nick. Sure like, is. Nick mentioned that to me, that, like, Alton Towers is his, like, go-to European park when he goes. Yeah, it's, it's pretty stunning. Like, just the atmosphere there. You really feel like you're in the presence of something really special that also happens to have coasters. But mm -hmm. you're like, that, that's, like, 400 years old, that that's, whole... That's wild. Like, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the castle and stuff. And you can walk through it. Like, it's... Yeah, I remember watching uh, Nemesis on like uh, a couple coaster specials when I was a kid. The that, world's greatest roller coaster mm, thrills in 3D. That's probably what it was. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the, the VHS with the, the VHS sleeve. Yeah, yeah, I have that too. Still have that. So yeah. that's what really like sold me Nemesis. on Nemesis. It just made it look so like <laughs> intense and oh man, yeah, the blood red river. And just, yeah, I just remember the special where the world record of the most naked people in Nemesis happened, and I was yeah. like, oh, this goes there. Oh, that was <laughs> <laughs> what? Like, what? I didn't even you know that. that? 
They always they do that like but, every year. Oh, do you? Yeah, they like um, oh they have to like or whenever they have a new coaster, they're like oh uh, let's get a bunch of people to ride. So it's my kind of party, but no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, don't go at Halloween though because I did it last year at Halloween and it was a bit too busy for my taste, uh, a bit too rainy as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's Europe indeed. Uh, then my number three is uh, Schwur des Kernen <laughs> at Hansa Park. <laughs> Gerslauer's Bay. Yeah, that, that, that Gerslauer blew me away. Like, okay, how did they make this? When you step into the park and you come up close to the tower, you're like watching the steel structure and you're like, whoa, what is happening here? And then... Yeah, the, the speed that it has, is, it's incredibly fast, especially in the low points. And the tower itself is stunning. It's like higher than the original tower. So it's, it's, it's really something. Now, on that, the, the ride kind of like confused me a little bit because the very first element after the drop looks like it was definitely supposed to be a rollover, but then it needs some more airtime. And so, you know, kind of get rollover vibes from that first element. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Was it meant to be one, or is it, or is it always kind of just planned to be an airtime element? I'm not sure either. It just looks like one big spaghetti work, and uh, it's, it's, yeah, it, I, my mind really couldn't get it. You know, it uh-huh. was. Hmm? I can't believe the then, superstructure for that thing. Just I know, a mess. Like, I mean, it's great to look at. It's a nice mm-hmm. mess, but it's like I it, find, I find it kind <laughs> of hard to believe the Gerslauers were in charge. Of that. I mean, yeah, they, they make yeah. very, you know, they're. They're known for smaller projects, for sure. Not like one of the biggest, yeah. biggest hyper coasters. They don't always build, yeah, hyper coasters, but especially that's what the Infinity one. brand is all about. The Infinity coasters, doing yeah. all whatever you want it to be. And then I rode like Gold Rush at Slachar. Oh, we love the yes. ride! And then I was like, <laughs> then once again, I was like, whoa, Infinity is fun. So yeah. with two new ones coming this year, yeah. I'm very excited. I love how but it's picking that's up steam. Later. The product line. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Because hang time, honestly, hate to offend anyone in California right now, but hang time isn't that good. Hang time is fine. But Gerslauer's uh, Gold Rush is much better, in my opinion. Well, yeah, like Monster mm. and Adventureland is a is a knockout. Like, that ride is so spectacular. Mm. It was so much better than it needed to be mm-hmm. because, it, you know, no offense to anyone from Iowa, but, like, Adventureland <laughs> could have gotten away with, like, a production model basic coaster, but they just, like, went all the way with that ride and, like, Every mm. every potential thing that you could do with an infinity coaster of that, yeah, of like a, the looping variety, they just did it. So, kudos to Gershwauer. Mm-hmm. Next up, so then my number two. Oh, sorry. No, no, yeah, no. I'm, I'm wondering what your number two is. Okay, it's Twisted Colossus oh. at Six Flags Magic Mountain. Is this your basic answer? <laughs> my basic answer? Yeah. <laughs> so our basic number one well, of Lightning Rod and Steel mm-hmm. Vengeance have... They've now met well, it was one. my first RMC, and uh, that's going to change this year. But for now, I put it on number two. And then finally, uh, maybe another basic answer, but number one is Tarun, of course. Okay. Oh, Fantasialand. That's not basic. That's good. Yeah, I like that. That's I mean, best. I like it after 5 p.m. Yeah. Like, it needs to warm up. But yeah, I rem- I remember the first time you guys wrote it with me. You were like, mm. "Is that it? <laughs> Is that all it does?" And then after five, it was much better. And then we but it. this time, then we wrote it twelve like, times in a row, and we're like, "Actually, this is great." <laughs> <laughs> but I was there last week, and then we wrote it about I think three o'clock or something, and already then it was wow. Even with the cold and everything. My mom got on it as well, and she oh. was in shock after the end. That's cute. Because she's like, it's not going upside down. No, no, it's fine. You'll, do, you'll be fine. And, and well, <laughs> she didn't expect it. That's so cute. I feel like the inversion is like the underdog, because everyone like judges a roller coaster by their inversion, but like some intense airtime could definitely make a much more spilling experience than like inversion. the unwritten rule of like the difference between a family coaster and a non-family coaster is whether or not it has a loop. Like, once it has a loop, then, like, younger children are like, that's unacceptable. Like, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, I remember as a kid. But it can be, like, like, wow. be, like, a giga coaster, and little kids are like, oh, that looks fun. But, like, <laughs> yeah. a 70-foot coaster with a loop in it, they're like, uh-uh. That's not okay. I ain't going on that. <laughs> 
So we're gonna get to my top five now, which is very mm-hmm. unconventional, I guess. I got some, I got some basic, basic white girl answers in there. But uh, <laughs> my first one is a show off moment: Tron Light Cycle Power Run in Shanghai Disney, mm-hmm. of course. That's on both of our lists. Mm-hmm. It's on both of our lists. Okay. It's, it's on our homepage at the website. Amazing. It is this next level. Tron Light Cycle Power Run is like our mascot. As That's of right, right now, <laughs> the fastest roller coaster Disney's ever built: sixty-five miles per hour. Yeah. And um, once you get inside, the coaster kind of so. isn't as intense, so you really can't go in there expecting, like, you know, an intense launch coaster towards the second half, but it's just so visually stunning. You weren't overly taken, like, you were, the expectations were high, and then we rode it, and you were like, okay, that was really good. But it wasn't but it was just great. like Tara, it was like, okay, you don't ride <laughs> launch coasters in the morning. Yeah. Like, that's they really, have to warm up. <laughs> you gotta get the credit, but you really enjoy it more in the evening. Especially when it's dark out and the canopy lights up. It's just, it's, a, it's an experience off-ride, on-ride. It's just, it's my number one. Also, I love Vekoma because I'm from Holland. So That's there you go. That's basically why we moved to Orlando. <laughs> it's like, oh, you're building one at Walt Disney World? Okay, we're moving. And so we got our apartment here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next on my list would be an Aftershock at Silverwood. Amusement park in Idaho, <laughs> of all places. We're not judging you. It's another Pacoma coaster, if you can figure. <laughs> um, the giant inverted boomerang, intense, slightly rough, but um, yeah, just one of my favorites. Um, it really, really was enamored with Deja Vu at Magic Mountain, and I saw that thing being taken apart in front of my eyes. But now I got to experience so the other one. Of course I am. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Um, then my, my basic wide goal entry comes in. <laughs> Fury 325, because, you know, I mean, there's no extension to this. I think it's Fury 325. Oh, really? 325, 325. everyone. <laughs> I didn't realize that until Media Day. And they're like, welcome to the Media Day for Fury 325. And I was like, <laughs> sounds like an area code. What is this? Yeah. It's like, area code 325? The area code for airtime. <laughs> do you know you have me to thank for for that ride? You do. I went to Canada's Wonderland, and the year after, they built Leviathan. I went to Carowinds, and the year after, they built Fury. Oh. So it was like, thank you. Well, you went to Knott's Berry Farm, and look what happened. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a Knott's little... Knott's Berry Farm did not get the gig. It's a little backstory there. So. Like, Sven comes over from Belgium, and we're, like, super excited to take mm-hmm. him to Knott's Berry Farm. But in true Knott's Berry Farm fashion, everything is closed. <laughs> there's, like, there's, like, only Pony Express yeah. open, and we're like, this yeah, is it's perfect. Like, the log flume is down because it's February. Montezuma's Revenge mm-hmm. is being difficult. Accelerator. It's was, Accelerator. It's Accelerator, you know. Yeah. Uh, hang Time hadn't opened yet. So the main attraction was Boys and Bear Ice Cream, and, and that was uh, that. the fries. <laughs> oh, <from> yeah. <laughs> For the record, I prefer that over Little Whip, so. Wow. Yes. Okay. A little shout out to Nuts here. Wow. That sounds like an Instagram poll. <laughs> that kind of compliment poll. first. Yeah. <laughs> an Instagram poll waiting to happen. Are you team Dole Whip? There you have it. Very soft serve. I love it. I feel like too many people haven't tried Boys and Bear soft serve yeah. on that Disney train, so yeah. they wouldn't even Yeah, that's a very California gym. question. But all the yeah. Cedar, <laughs> Cedar Point fanboys would just put the Cedar Fair answer. By that's default. true. I think it would answer, I think it would balance out. My number four on the list is Dragon and Ocean Park in Hong Kong because it's an arrow looper. Because Ron Toomer was crazy. I love like arrow Fox. loopers. Also, <laughs> this thing is suspended several hundred feet over the ocean. It's just draped and over a cliff facing the, the color south scheme, sea. The color scheme is completely unnecessary. It's the strangest thing. <laughs> And then, like, you go through the loop. What's okay, the color it's, scheme? It's a rainbow. It's every color. It's every color, yeah. <laughs> they so couldn't okay. decide what The track color. is purple, yellow, and green. And then the supports are orange flames on yellow, su- on, on purple supports with, like, mm, green hints. It. It's like... It's like Lisa Frank just threw up all over it. I mean, I, <laughs> nobody knows who Lisa Frank no, is. No, I just no, aged myself. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think Nick is the only one who knows it. Lisa Frank did a bunch of, like, it's very 90s, like, stationary and pencils and stuff, and it was all, like, bright colors and rainbows and unicorns and stuff, and that was <laughs> that was the aesthetic. And now it's making a comeback yeah, because the saying. 90s are, are huge. Pretty sure it's making a comeback. These yeah, days. everyone really? loves Lisa Frank Lisa now. Frank yeah. Yeah. I just went to Magic Kingdom yesterday, and, like, the ticketing and transport system, whatever, center, is literally the 90s with yeah. all the colors. Terrible. Um... <laughs> Next right on my list is a lightning rod, and I've now got to have an RMC on there as well. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's the best RMC I've we written. are what? Basic. But I have yet to write Steve, or Steel Don't Vengeance. Don't call it Steve. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Steven! <laughs> oh. I want to take a ride in my disco, Steven. <laughs> <laughs> You're the worst person. <laughs> but yeah, Lightning Rod's on there for obvious reasons, and perhaps Steve will be on there one day as well. <laughs> we got that excellent ride on Lightning Rod in March of last year, and like 
I think it was the only day in history that the ride ran for the whole day without breaking down, like, ever. So it was really, it was warmed up really well and had been running consistently two trains, and we rode it. It was, like, dusk or something, and, like, you, we'd already ridden it twice that day. I'd ridden it on a couple of occasions, and we rode it, and it was, like, it was so aggressive. I was... I almost lost my it, shirt. It really like, hurt. <laughs> it wasn't. It was. Oh, wow. I mean, it was great. It's like you're kind of pain, you know. But it was like, like a pleasure roll pain. They've run into more problems with that ride now that it's running consistently. Because before it was like, oh, it's breaking down every day. Like we don't have to worry about this thing actually getting warmed up. But the, now, like when it actually reaches its full potential, like it just starts hammering the track because yeah. it goes so fast. Like it's just it's, it gets it gets a little painful. They get it but to run pretty. It's a very very good for ride. A couple of days, and they're like, "Oh, we have potholes under the ride. Oh, we have we're sending people to the emergency room. Like, oh, these are problems. Okay, still a great ride mm-hmm. though." So we got some more questions here because what is a better way to Wait, know did someone? You fini- did you finish your top t- your top five? Yeah, my top five is liner rod. Oh, okay. Sorry, you went. Oh, you went backwards. That's right. That's right. Okay. So the next question is, do you collect theme park merchandise? The answer is you better collect yes. theme park merchandise. But what do you collect? Sven, what do you collect? Uh, I think the better question is, what do I not collect? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a pretty big Disney fan, so I have a lot of Disney pins. Um, pins besides good. that, I have magnets. I also have some Funko Pops. Just some. As you cannot see behind me. Yeah, for those of you who want, like, a mental idea of how many Funko Pops this dude has, like, we're Skyping with him right now, and that's all you can see is his face <laughs> and a background of Funko Pops. All of it. Floor to yeah, ceiling. Yeah, I can start a shop if I want. Everywhere, yeah. yep. If you ever broke, you can make some good money off of that. Insane. That's what people say. Yeah, about some of them are the 90s. pretty so valuable. It's not like, true. <laughs> And it's hard when you're in Europe because all the exclusive ones usually are for sale in the States, so... Well, that's why I got friends in Orlando. Yeah. Thank you. Did you see you. The, the new one, the Alice teacup one? I want that that's one. That's super cute. But now that they're doing if, ones that are like rides, I'm like, okay, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm interested. Yeah. Like, you have my that's attention. That's really cool. You better have a Tron one like, when it comes to... Like, a Millennium Force Funko Pop? I'm I like, have a Tron one. People would buy that. Send me pictures, man. The hell? <laughs> it's not the, it's not a motorcycle one, or it's just the figure Tron. That's cool. I was like, I need to have cool. one. And um, then, of course, the park maps. I have a whole cupboard full, because uh, yeah, and all kinds of leaflets and everything. I like to collect those. Uh, and. As you saw, I recently bought a huge Disneyland Paris poster to decorate. You mean Euro Disneyland I, poster? Yes, sorry, Euro <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> like first and like edition. in my, I have a lot of stairs, and then on the side of the stairs, I bought the attraction posters uh, from Disneyland Paris, and those are pretty cool as well. I'd also want to see when you enter the, like Main Street, like when you go through the tunnels. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so yeah, they made that's like a, that's a sick. Yeah. Yeah, they have two sets, but I only bought the first set, and it's they're not very big, but that way it's it's convenient to ha- have not your whole house covered, you know. Yeah, no, I got but you. But who wouldn't want that? Well, we gotta keep mm-hmm. a little, at least a little bit of box space left. No. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Nick? What do you collect? Uh, well, I don't really collect anything per se. I do have a, a bunch of theme park like knickknacks, miscellaneous things. I guess the thing I have the most of is uh, like roller coaster shirts and polos. Um, I oh, really yeah. like that the parks are coming out with like some polo shirts now with the roller coaster logos on I them. Like that too. So I've got a, I've got a couple of those. Fancy. I've got a, a great Mako one, a Fury 325 one, um, some just generic mm. theme park like logo shirts. Those are good. Uh, I also have some knickknacks like the. Um, metal models I think it's Coaster Dynamics that makes those those are those are awesome uh, and one of my favorite things that I have is the, the piece of wood from Mean Streak with the Steel Vengeance logo on it that I got from Me Day Steel Vengeance that thing is on my desk I love it that is cool nice what do you yeah I forgot you? about those t-shirts you know I have them too and oh my god they, talking yeah. about polos they have one from Baron 1898 and it's pretty <laughs> oh, cool. cool I was messing with the date and I was like 1989 yeah. <laughs> I was thinking <laughs> and then <laughs> did I get it right? okay yeah, yeah, yeah you got it right <laughs> yeah Alex is big on t-shirts too he, I have so many t-shirts and like, my mother really taught me to just never throw anything away ever so so moving mm-hmm. from like 
California to Alabama to Orlando. It was like the amount of damn t-shirts I've seen. Yeah. Now. It's like my, my parents live in Alabama. That's mentally why we damaged. There. That's where a lot of my stuff was, and so we brought the stuff. And my mom kept bringing, pulling out these boxes, like, "Oh, here's more of your t-shirts that I kept." And I'm like, "I'm so proud of you." <laughs> um, but yeah, t-shirts. Like, I just that's the best way to get you know something that's kind of useful that looks nice and it packs easily like like i know people who collect shot glasses and those not only do you have to dust those a lot but like it's also a perfectly good chance that like every time you buy a shot glass you risk also like breaking it on your way to your house like (laughs) glass souvenirs and stuff like that can yeah be challenging for that reason but yeah so t-shirts my number one thing though that i collect is keychains and not just a few keychains. I have thousands and thousands of keychains. Not just from theme parks, but mostly. Primarily theme parks, but also just from anywhere that I've ever been. Hmm. And they're the bane of Sean's existence, because they're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> they're very cute once every five there's, months. There's a few. I, I love trying to show him my keychains. He's like, that's great, babe. That's, you know, that, no, that's I'm, just like I'm a respectful ones. partner. I watch, I watch the entire show, and I'm like, love it. But then I'm really excited to put him away again. <laughs> <laughs> but where do you keep them then? In the closet. <laughs> right now. Someday we'll have another bedroom and it'll be the keychain room. And all of my the cork keychain boards room. of keychains that are organized by region and year mm. <laughs> can, can go on the wall. Yeah, we can, we can open a keychain museum of Orlando yeah. and like be legit. You know, people would... People in Orlando yeah. would that would that would work. I think people would be you know like if the Holy Land experience can make it, so could our keychain. The Holy Keychain experience. <laughs> the keychain keychain land. Keychain. <laughs> the keychain land experience. <laughs> um, but yeah, so really, shirts, keychains, and then anything unusual. Like sometimes you'll go to a park and they have a souvenir of some kind that you're like, oh, that's different. Like I have a little tea set from Canopy Lake, like little tiny ceramic saucer and cups with like rides on them. It's like the most mm. random thing. I've never been to a park before where I've seen like a miniature tea set with rides on it. So obviously I bought it. And then like there was, when I went to Happy Valley in Shenzhen, the one that has bullet coaster, the best launch coaster in the world. Show off on that. Except for lightning rod. <laughs> um, they have a, a Hus topspin there themed to... Uh, a transformer of some kind, kind of like the one at Movie Park Germany. And it's apparently really popular because they have a 3D foam puzzle of their topspin. So, like, I haven't put it up, but I bought it because I'm like, this mm-hmm. is so bizarre. It's, it's not so just, strange. It's like, just a real puzzle, but it's a 3D, and I think it works. Like, I think you can spin the, the, the carriage, and it actually, like, rotates. Well, I like, do like the 3D, like, coaster and coaster dynamics. Coaster yeah, the dynamics, nano coasters. The nano coasters. Yeah, I, have, I have one of those, too. Those are pretty sick. Like, we have a little Fury one here. Those are getting a lot of traction. I think they're great. Yeah, you have one, don't you? I have yeah. a couple of those, yeah. That's cool. Which ones do you have? Uh, I have Fury... I have still Vengeance, and you just have to. Yeah, we have That's Fury. Cool. Yeah, we have Fury. Is yours painted? No. Okay. Sweet. Yeah, because now they're painting them. I think I like the silver aesthetic more, the old yeah. aesthetic. The yeah. silver ones, I think, are a little cooler. Although, like, if you're trying to match with decor, like, I think the, the painted ones have their place as well. It kind of just depends on the coaster. But it's a really nice color. Like, if they made a Mako one, like, I would love to have a painted Mako one. Yeah. But if it was, like... Dragon. Well, I mean, Mako has the best paint scheme. If it was like a dragon at at Ocean Park and it's like <laughs> too much, seventeen <laughs> colors, I'd be like, "That's okay. <laughs> this doesn't go with anything in my house. <laughs> We're just gonna put it in the guest bathroom." At the same time, in a way, it does because every color possible is in there. <laughs> that's basically the, the, yeah. like green in this room. Yeah, I guess that's true. And what I really collect is uh, like flat bill snapbacks anywhere possible. I've one from every single Disney resort now. Um, a fair one would be like the Hong Wait, Kong Disney Wait, you still don't have ones. one from Walt Disney World. Oh, well, I guess it's just a We bought those snapbacks one. at Publix. They don't it's count. true. <laughs> so I'm missing one from Walt Disney World. The Publix near Disney World has lots of merchandise, including really nice hats. And we bought those just because they were $10. But we still, he still needs one from the resort proper to complete yeah. his collection. But some cool ones that I do have would be like a really nice Leviathan one um, mm-hmm. from Canada's Wonderland. Definitely the most expensive piece of merch you probably ever purchased. Yeah, it, it was, was worth it. Bucks, uh, 60 it was bucks. Beautiful. It was really nice. And then, um, what else do I have? That's funny. Hoodies. Oh, I got a Fury one. Uh, it's pretty nice. And oh, then yeah. I'm really big on collecting yeah. hoodies. Hooded sweatshirts. Yeah, hang time, Your Aftershock. Hooded sweatshirt. See, Silverwood Min- has amazing merchandise, you guys. 
I don't know. It's really out of the way, so if you get there, you might as well buy a sweater. Yeah. Um. <laughs> if you go there, you're probably only going to go there once, so buy the merchandise. Yes, yeah, so that's really what I'm big on. Hoodies or hooded sweatshirts and snapbacks. At least yep. your stuff is like, you can wear it, it's actually useful. Yep. Unlike my keychains, which... Well, they look really nice. Appreciate the fashion, man. <laughs> Thanks, babe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you guys have also have stuff on your wall, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we, we are recently in the um, in the whole theme of buying the Made to Thrill posters. A little plug for Made to Thrill. Yeah, Made to Thrill.com. They have the greatest posters, self designed. You mm-hmm. have a Tron poster, Kumba, Viper, and Matterhorn. Yeah. All some of our very, very favorites. Very situated in our living room. And then Nick also bought some Made to Thrill stuff. What'd you get? Uh, I bought a bunch of t-shirts and a sticker pack. So Stickers! Love those t-shirts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Stickers. You know who else likes stickers? Lisa Frank. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they were this nice. <laughs> they, they should collab. <laughs> they, oh my god. I Made really need to look her up. You Google Lisa Frank. You will not be disappointed. Made I think it's really your aesthetic, Sven. The Lisa Frank's collection by my Maggie aesthetic. Thrill. <laughs> it's, it's also like if Lisa Frank and Ocean Park collaborated, because that would be that would be the real dream. Like they could really just repaint it and retheme it to like Lisa Frank the Ride Dragon. Absolutely. Still have to Google her, but yeah. I'll do that at a later time. <laughs> The next question uh, that is a really cliche question, but Sven came up with it, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> We're going to go and wonder, what was everyone's first theme park and first roller coaster? What was yours, Sven? Mm-hmm. Well, it wasn't an easy question, actually, to answer <laughs> myself. But I think my first theme park was uh, Meli Park in uh, Belgium, which now became uh, Plopsaland like 20 oh. years ago. Which one? The co? The original Plopsaland? No, the original one at oh, the, oh. the at the beach in the Pana. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it was really nice. It was basically Meili is a brand for honey. And so they created a theme park around it. So I remember also going with school and learning about the bees and everything. Oh. So it also was educational. And then... Coaster-wise, it wasn't that special, but it had, like, a, f- a huge flying carpet and uh, a dark ride, the Apirama dark ride, which was really cool as well. Um, but as for first coaster, I'm not sure if it was, like, the seated one right there, like the ladybug coaster design type. Mm-hmm. The Tivoli um, ones. Yeah, the Tivoli's, exactly. But I do remember my first inversion coaster, and that was Cobra at Walibi, Belgium. Out of Cobra Boomerang? So, yeah, it's a boomerang. We approve. So, uh, it was not that special, but... We disagree. Well, <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, For the us, original color scheme on Cobra was cool, like with the dark blue and dark red. I remember that from Roller Coaster Tycoon. It was so unconventional, I had like mm-hmm. a dark blue track and red supports. I feel like everyone had like red track and blue supports you know but they all the superman coasters yeah because all superman coasters great. but yeah but I now like uh now it's gone it's but, gone yeah the not the coaster oh yeah, yeah the, the colors color yeah, yeah <laughs> yellow and purple right <laughs> like that, Sven. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's getting ready for karma world the new uh themed area at the what be belgium are they, gonna, are they gonna give it uh, a boomerang makeover like it did at the other parks i'm not sure they're, they haven't said anything about it, but for now we only know that it has a new color scheme. And the station was pretty ugly, so I hope that they found something nice for that as well. Might as well add a new train um, to it then. Yeah. MK1212, please. Yeah, but then the same day, the same day I rode uh, Vampire, an SLC. Hooray! And uh, yeah. also a Schwarzkopf coaster. Turbine! Then it was still Turbine... Yeah, that was really cool. I love that. That movie. is really neat. I haven't ridden it, but I love it. Wait, did you ride a turbine or did you ride a Sirocco? Uh, not a Sirocco, but I rode it as turbine. And I really liked how you stepped in. All of a sudden it was dark and you launched at that at the exact same time. So that gave a nice effect. That's cool. Fun fact, they put that ride in a building for two reasons. One, because it was loud and there's residential areas mm-hmm. over there, right? And number two, mm-hmm. there was a highly publicized incident where the ride oh, yeah. got stuck in the loop. And it hung down. Oh, yeah. And people, no one got hurt except uh, probably emotionally because I think hanging from a Schwarzkopf lap bar in a loop sounds like really terrible. 
And yeah, it was, it's not my choice. And fine. apparently, like, so they, they killed two birds with one stone. They, they put the loop in a box because they were like, okay, this is going to help dampen the sound. Also to trick people into thinking that the ride was different now because the, the incident was so highly publicized and was really bad press mm-hmm. for the park. It's funny. And now it's completely it covered. covered. Yeah, and now Psyche Underground is a totally enclosed mm-hmm. ride. Because it used to, it would pop out. Psyche Underground. Yeah. <laughs> They've got the soundtrack. The soundtrack. <laughs> I love this song. Gershlauer. Um, so, what about you, Sean? Well, yeah, so my first go is like a bit of an embarrassing story. So, my very first roller coaster was the um, Coyote und... <laughs> Coyote und Roadrunner. Roadrunner. Roller coaster. Achterbahn. Achterbahn. <laughs> In Wonder Brothers Movie World, Germany. In <laughs> Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's Movie Park Germany. Uh, so that was honestly the best themed roller skater ever built. Like, even Disney couldn't do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was, like, completely engulfed in rock work. It was, like, a mini Big Thunder Mountain, but it was actually used as a little roll- roller skater. I was scared shitless. My first big theme park, first roller coaster, but I had to get on one. Are we allowed to swear on here? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking a serious question, because I, I like that's swearing. Not, I feel like that's not much of a swear word. Uh, um, yes, it is. Anyways, <laughs> I was getting to the part where I peed my pants. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because I was so nervous. And then we spent two hours in the restroom trying to get it all, like, fixed up. But it was worth it, because it was, it was my great, it was a great little first roller coaster. And then we did Tom and Jerry, Mouse in the House, right next to it after that, which is my Mac. Mac, um, Mac Mouse. Mac Mouse. Hmm. Our first inverting coaster uh, was Looping Star in Saharan. Um, made rest in peace. But Classic it was Schwarzkopf. My entire family had seen their first launch co- uh, their first looping coasters were all yeah. were all that same Schwarzkopf. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not a coaster family, but every single person in my immediate family that was their first looping coaster. It was like the Dutch. It was like iconic. Yeah, it was iconic. That yeah. one in Python. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that was, that, that was like the icon before Python. And now, so, Thunder Looper, what, is that Thunder Loop? Is that what it's called? It was, it was called Thunder Loop looping for a while, thunder, sort yeah. of. Yeah. Now it's in Cyprus, and it's everyone yes. in Cyprus's first looping coaster. It's true, because Cyprus doesn't have any Cyprus looping coasters. Cyprus doesn't have any other coasters. Or any coaster in general. Of any kind. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was my first, because um, that was actually close between most of the European parks. Because um, I lived on the border, yeah. yeah. And... Um, yeah, I do do really hold that place highly. Even though I know seeing some some rough times after they lost their Warner Brothers license, and they got sold a few times. I think Moon mm-hmm. Park is coming out of pretty strong. I think they're doing, I think they're doing okay. Everybody loves a good comeback, and that's exactly they're what's doing happening. okay. Yeah, yeah, I think they're doing the okay. Star Trek ride is is a knockout. Yeah, I love Star Trek. Um, it's definitely much different than all the, all the other Max. Not as airtime oriented. It has a lot more hang time rather than like going through the layout fast. But yeah, it's a good mm-hmm. ride. I love the pre shows. <laughs> Nick, what in is your... Uh, oh, in Germany, yeah. Yeah. I still love them, even though I can't understand them. Yeah, Borg Cube! That's how I feel <laughs> about any foreign ride, like in China or Germany. It's like, oh, all the pre-show and everything's in German. It adds a little magic, Japanese, but it's a different language. But I'm like, I can just imagine it being something really cool that they're saying. Even if it's just, like, safety procedures. Please stay seated with your head back. Move forward. <laughs> yeah. Launch. We're Sounds like, yes! Like cool in <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how about you, Nick? What was your first theme park? Uh, my first theme park was uh, Magic Kingdom, Walt Disney World. Oh. I, I grew up going to oh. parks. Yeah. <laughs> my family was a huge uh, theme park family, so we were we always went to Disney every year for vacations, and yeah. And so that was my first park. My first roller coaster uh, was Space Mountain, and I just remember being terrified getting in line. Um, <laughs> going back a little before that. When Tower of Terror opened, maybe it was like a year or two after it opened, I was like five or six, and we were in line, and I remember getting into the first pre-show room with the, uh, like the TV screen, and thinking that was the ride, and just freaking out and crying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we left down the chicken elevator they had in the middle of the, the little platform, elevator. because I was just like, I w- wasn't having it, so I finally got up the courage to ride Space Mountain a couple of years later, and that was my first roller coaster, and I've been hooked ever since. Uh, and then my first, like, big looping roller coaster was uh, Dueling Dragons Fire, Rest in Peace. I miss mm-hmm. those rides. So a moment of silence. Yeah. Did you ride Extraterrestrial Alien Encounter? I did not, unfortunately. I really wish oh. I had, but that was also one of those things. I feel like that's everyone's nightmare. Yeah, that was back when I was I still too afraid. I had a <laughs> meltdown. The whole family. Because we were there in 99, and we're Disneyland people. And we're like, oh, this will be fun. It seems interesting. And, like... It was so over the top and so scary, and I'm pretty... I was eight, 
And she gave a little bit of a background on the ride because I'm pretty sure a lot of our readers may not exactly know what the ride or the attraction well, the floor, was. I guess the, all you Floridians out here, you know, you know about extraterrestrial alien encounter. It used to be the, like the rocket ship to the moon theater attraction. It wasn't really a ride. It was just like a basic circular si- s- theater facing the center, and it was meant to simulate, you know, a rocket ship. Uh, take off into Earth, but once that became... Into Earth? Yeah, or, uh, to, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, you did wind up back at Earth That's again, a Disney scene. Eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Journey to the center of space. <laughs> um, the, but then after the, the whole... I mean, once once people... Once like NASA was routinely going to Earth... Or going to the moon, excuse me. <laughs> it was really not that exciting, like the concept. So they're like, okay, we're going to partner with the uh, the Alien franchise and do a ride where you're like... Being uh, attacked by the by the alien monster, and then actually the the cross branding between Alien and Disney that that never went to fruition because they they kind of doubled down or they they backed out because it was an R rated franchise. Although they did have an Alien scene in the Great Movie Ride, um, they ultimately decided to do a, a, like a, a, a custom storyline. Problem was the ride was already built, so like they kind of shoehorned them uh, uh, you know a basic like a custom story out of it and basically so you're you're part of this was part of the 1994 remodel of Tomorrowland and you were doing some sort of intergalactic commerce or something i think they were demonstrating like teleportation pods and then like the the teleportation thing is intercepted by a carnivorous alien that is sort of like a giant oversized housefly monster and you're like in the theater and you're kind of stuck in there and like there's a lot of like there's a part there was a part where like the lights would go out and the monster you could hear the monster running around and like a cast member screaming and then the lights come on and it's like raining blood and there's like tattered cast member uniform like hanging from the catwalk. <laughs> Sounds walks. very Disney. Oh my god. I mean, I I I still remember just being just totally traumatized. I was like, I just I can't I can't do this. Didn't didn't those have his trains because people tried to get out? Yeah, they had like these horse collar things oh, that god. were sort of like a normal shoulder harness, but they didn't come down over your chest really. They were just over your neck. And, oh, so is it? Sh- so they kind of they were sort of. Just, Are they kind of like the Intamin free fall, like the first generation, <laughs> where it's almost like you were a little? It was sort of yeah. It was. <laughs> I know someone did. Like I think the, the the nail in the coffin for that thing was that like someone did try to like. Someone did successfully weasel themselves out of the harness because they were mm-hmm. so terrified, and they also and they hurt themselves. They're, they're themselves pretty badly, like they, they, they dislocated their shoulder or something. Don't quote me on that, I, but I just know someone <laughs> someone got hurt <laughs> trying to get out of the alien alien encounter, and so it, they turned it into Stitch Encounter. So Nick, on the topic of Tomorrowland and that being your first roller coaster or Space Mountain rider, which side do you prefer? I, I honestly can't tell the difference. You gotta pick a side. I gotta pick a side. Yeah, your choices are Alpha or Omega. Yeah, yeah. I gotta go with the Alpha side. That's the one on the left, right? Uh, if you walk right in, so, it'd be on the left. Yeah. 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 That's the one I feel like I get pushed to the most. So. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, the other day, I mean, I'm usually terrified that ride because the clearances are so not topable friendly. Like, there's no, there's so much room between my lap bar because it's on my knees and, like, my, you know, so I get to, like, on the drops, I get some actual air and I fly out of my seat, but then, like, the clearances are so low and that structure is just it's scary stuff. Just for you tall people out there, don't ride it. Actually, ride it, but ride be, it. be careful. Just don't put your hands up. I really want to get a lights on ride one of these days. That's a, that's a bucket list thing. Sean got me. one on the Anaheim Space Mountain, his very first Space Mountain ride. I was quite Ooh. upset because I had watched <laughs> these videos to ride layout because I was a nerd and then I rode it and then the lights are on. I was like, great. I came here for the stars, not for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, what's your first, Alex? Um, my first abuse, my first roller coaster, my first theme park are the same place, but not the same year. My first trip to uh, like my first trip to Disneyland, like I'm pretty sure I was, my mother was eight months pregnant with me, if that counts. So I know we were at Disneyland <laughs> a month before I was born, um, and then probably also visits to the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk um, from the time. I feel like you were conceived in the Beach Boardwalk. That's what my dad always says. He was like, you were um, conceived on the Giant Dipper, son. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact. <laughs> That's for my parents. My parents were ride operators at the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. They met when they were 19. Um, so the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk is pretty much our, is like our, our family crest. Um, so either the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk or uh, Disneyland, which my parents grew up going to Disneyland periodically. And um, my sister, who's five years older than me, always loved Disney and that was where she went every year for her birthday and my sister 
her birthday's in July, mine's in August, so I know that for my sister's fifth birthday, we went to Disneyland, and I was born three weeks later. Um, and then also, we went again when I was 11 months old, and a year and 11 months old. And then when we, the year that we went when I was two and I actually remember those days. Keep going. So it was my sister's birthday. That's what I remember. <laughs> it's always right before my sister's birthday. Um, right before I turned three, so this was my sister's uh, eighth birthday, we, uh, we, were, we went to ride Matterhorn bobsled. And these were the old, the old bob configuration where you could sit in someone's lap. I think the height requirement was 35 inches, which is, I think, what... Um, isn't, isn't that what like Gadgets Go Coaster and like Barnstormer I used to hear 36 like the last person to ask what height minimums is me well, my, <laughs> yeah <laughs> right we worry about the height maximums with you um, but yeah so my parents were, were going to do the child swap thing because that's just what they were expecting because they, they didn't even plan on me being able to ride but the cast member just ushered us all into the bob all together and so I sat in my mom's lap so I was that was yeah so I, w- I was not yet three when I rode uh, the Matterhorn bobsleds, and it's still one of my favorite roller coasters. I feel like you must be one of the youngest people mm-hmm. to get on a roller coaster. Though, the skinny coasters, I guess. I know some people are pretty who, friendly who rode, yeah. like... I, I have a friend who rode the Great American Scream Machine at Six Flags Over Georgia when he was two, because they just used to not have any sort of height thing. Like, if you could sit oh, right wow. in the seat and hold on... The thing has buzz bars. You could can yeah. get air. Yeah, I know. I, can you imagine a two-year-old that tr- I ride with buzz bars? Like, we're going to talk like, air yeah. time. <laughs> there was no seat belts. There was no height requirement. It was just like, all right, it's up to you. It's up to mom and dad. Like, you know, practice their discretion. That's funny. <laughs> so the next question I got is, uh, what is the most memorable coaster experience? Nick. You're up, Nick. Oh, man, I'm not ready for this. Putting on the spot. Kidding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. you, do you need some time? We can uh, no, no, we I can go. I can go. Um, this, probably why this one ranks in my like, top five, um, Magnum XL 200, uh, one of my first trips up to Cedar Point. Uh, we rode that at sunset. You know, just, I don't know, it's, it's when I fell in love with that ride. It, it's, it, it's, it has so many quirks to it. Like, it's, you know, it feels like the wheels are square sometimes. And it goes <laughs> you went to the lap bar. But... Just riding that with my friends and just laughing our asses off at how much, like, not really mm. pain we were in, but just, like, <laughs> how ridiculous that ride treats its riders. It just was so much fun. The way that some of the aero hypers track is pretty, like, it's entertaining, not necessarily but It's also right terrifying. Because, like, Pepsi Max and Desperado, Desperado. are the same way. Yeah. Like, we, we love them and we're entertained by them, but they also hurt. Yeah, but it's okay. <laughs> but yeah, and that's what makes it so memorable for me is that that was when I was like, all right, this is this is one of my favorite rides. It's just it's just fun, and that's that's what I look for in ranking rides. That's fair. Yeah, what is yours, Sven? Well, mine is uh, at Parkastrix. Ooh, it I was a uh, lover pronunciation of yeah. Parkastrix. It's nice hearing someone pronounce <laughs> it correctly instead of like what I try to do, which is the Americanized <laughs> version of every European. So it's name. not Park Asterix. It's <laughs> Park Asterix. Park Asterix. <laughs> Parks, we call it on the H yeah. Park Asterix. <laughs> hey, sir. For me, it's it's the other way around. I love how people mispronounce names like that. Probably I do it sometimes too. So. But, um, yeah, so we were at the park. It was sunny, as usual. So I, it was t-shirt weather. And then the lines there for Tonnerre de Zeus are always hell. Like, usually it's like 80 minutes. For me, that's hell. And, um, <laughs> that's fair. We, uh, so we decided to save it for the last ride of the day. And we started in the queue. And we waited for, like, 40 minutes. And then all of a sudden it gets dark, it gets, it starts to rain, it starts to, thunder and lightning, very suiting for, uh, for that, that right? Yeah, a little bit of the theme. But I was there in my t-shirt, remember? So it was pretty cold and it, the wind was blowing and people were leaving the queue. The park was still half an hour open and I was like, oh shit, we waited for nothing. But then a quarter before the end, they opened the ride back up. So it had rained, and so for those of you that don't know, it's a wooden coaster, and it was it was on the edge of is this safe or is this fun? Yeah, <laughs> like, I think and it's such a long ride. Are. Like I had my cell phone and everything. I was so scared of losing it, and 
I couldn't really see what was going on, but the the thrill and the excitement and um, we were with a group of friends and somebody's mom was on there as well. So I was like, oh, poor woman. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, in the end, it's like I remember it as being cool but terrifying at the same time. So. It's kind it was of funny. one of the best rides I ever had, though. On the topic of, like, rides opening right before park closing, we were at Wallaby Holland earlier this year, <laughs> and, like, uh, they were testing Express early in the day, and it valid, and they were like, the ride's down for the day, you can't ride it. We're, like, super upset. Then we see this large crane when we come back from lunch, and they literally took the train off the track with the crane. Car by car. Car by car. Disconnected it. And then 50 minutes before closing, mind you, it's an empty day. There's no 15, one at this park. One five. Like, one five. Like, there's 50 <laughs> 15 minutes left. 15 minutes before the park closed. We hear screaming. We're like, what the heck? And, like, we see that they are running Express. Everyone's running. To oh, the wow. Run. And everyone's running to it. Express. The entire queue is full. All the park guests from the day were <laughs> yeah. in there. I can't believe that the park would put in the effort. I mean, their operations are pretty, pretty shit sometimes. <laughs> but the fact that they put in all the effort into opening a coaster 50 minutes before closing on, like... A weekday, there was no one there, and, and they, had, they had to literally take a cra- train off the track with a crane in order to run it. I, I, I call it. And I needed, I needed the credit. And he I needed was the credit. very excited, even yeah. though it's just the outdoor version of Rock and Roller Coaster. It's, it's my, better. it's my favorite of the three. Yeah, and um, I was so, so grateful for that. <laughs> Yeah, for some reason it feels faster than the other two Especially in my mind. I think it has faster. less drag because the Sobot, the mm. onboard audio is so heavy. Yeah, when you come into like the mm. mid courses on the on the uh, rock and roller coasters, you really feel like it's kind of like making it through barely. But then, like on mm-hmm. Express, you kind of coast through that really quickly. I mean, there's no actual brakes oh, yeah. there, but yeah, there's no mid. You, you come into it much actually, faster too. Yeah. No, there's no. There's, well, there's, there's one mid course. Is the fir- because there's, the second one's not there. It's the more second. Like, the second mid course is you just roll through it. No, the first no, one you roll through it, and the then the one second one. The second one is you, there. Yeah, it's okay. like a trim. And what, what, what's yours? What's your um, favorite? most memorable? My most memorable. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of great. I have a lot of good. Like I think good roller coaster stories are kind of like fishing stories. Like everyone's got a lot of good ones. Then the more you do it, the more you have. So it's like it's hard for me to to pick just one. But I think well, you got it. One that really, <laughs> <laughs> um, one that really sticks out in my mind is. Um, the the wild mouse raton loco uh, spinning mouse at La Feria Chapultepec Magico in Mexico City they run this wild mouse with no trims or anything they just let it keep going until oh, wow. I mean I just imagine the the little circular mice just like shearing off of the axles and flying into the park like frisbees like because it just goes so inappropriately fast for how this ride I think it's a river John mouse like the ones at Disney mm-hmm. World and if you could just imagine them oh. never ever stopping <laughs> at any point to slow down and just getting faster and faster this thing was so violent I was sitting by myself on one side and I had two friends in the two seats on the other side and like I was just sliding around in my seat back and forth because the turns were so violent and I, I at one point I just got sick like my hip was starting to hurt because it was, I kept sliding and so I put my hand out to catch myself, and I dislocated my wrist um, on one of the turns of this ride. And Medical I, emergency in Mexico. <laughs> sounds like my kind of day. Like, that's literally. I like. I can't. I, I, but my friends were. Did they just? They what? They what? They turned pale. They were like, "Oh my god, are you okay?" And I'm like, "Well, I, I have an old wrist injury from uh, middle school where I fell down a flight of stairs because I am super graceful." Um, and so I can manually dislocate and relocate uh, my, my wrists. Um, please <laughs> I don't. Wish, I wish I could show you all. Like all shaking your their hands right now. You can imagine <laughs> me being able to just pop it in and out of place. I can do that. Uh, uh, you pop that but it's the first time that a roller coaster had ever done it for me. So um, <laughs> I um, so during mid after the shock of ha- of that having happened subsided, I just popped it back into place myself because I'm like I I can't go to an ER. In mm, Mexico. Mexico, I've got rides to ride. I've got coasters to, you know. <laughs> the park, this park has two Schwartz cops, and I intend on riding them all, both numerous times. Particularly the triple loop one, Chimera, is like the most violent roller coaster I've ever ridden, except for maybe the Wild Mouse right next to it. Because um, at least Chimera didn't, you know, cause me any sort of bodily harm. But yeah, I, my fingers didn't work for a couple hours. I was just kind of like exercising oh, wow. them. Um, just to make, you know, because the, the ligaments are just like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> this isn't supposed to happen. Um, but it ended up being kind of a non-event, aside from just being a funny story. I didn't have to go have an x-ray or anything, fortunately. 
See, my like favorite or most memorable coaster moment is definitely not as dramatic. I mean, I pee my pants pretty memorable, but uh, <laughs> I, think, I think the one that sticks out the most is we were as fortunate as we were. We went to Shanghai. We had planned like four theme parks. It was all going to be great. And then like the snowstorm moves in like after six years of no, 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 no snow. <laughs> and all of a sudden, all these theme parks are closed. So we're like forced, well, forced. To go to um, to, to Shanghai Disney for like three or four days, yeah. And so, but at one point it started snowing so incredibly bad that the entire park pretty much cleared. People were over it. It was like eight hours of, of nonstop snow. Yeah. And we're just amazed the park was still open. And um, us being who we are, we just decided to marathon Tron the last night. We got like forty rides in in total. And I think that's the most memorable, memorable moment. There was literally no one in the Tron queue. We were the only people on the Tron train. They, it was just like an mm-hmm. entire operation just for us. And then like every time you would come through the canopy, like the canopy covers you know, the train from snow. But there's one part of the turn where like the canopy ends and you just go with the si- light cycle. And it's like <laughs> through a mini blizzard. Of snow. <laughs> so like every ride we're like like just waiting for the moment that we're like it's getting like this face full of snow and then going inside the warm show building. It was just a weird thing. It was so magical. So it was it, it was really pretty magical, was. especially because the last thing you you think of is getting on a Disney e ticket attraction like forty times in a trip. Without having yeah. to, like, you know, share a train with anyone. The only price we paid was a face full of snow. Yeah. And, yeah, so that was, that was definitely one of those things. In your face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we also, I mean, they have the Snow White coaster there, too. I, I like I like Orlando's version better than than uh, Shanghai's because Orlando's has the... Midway. It has, well, it's, it's better integrated and it's got the, the Q interaction games and stuff. And it's got that scene at the end that was rescued from... The Snow White Scary Adventures ride, the scene of, of Snow White and Dopey dancing in the house. Um, oh. But we'll never be able to say that we rode uh, Orlando's Snow White coaster in the snow, but we did. Is it one of those glorious as it sounds? It's just so cold. It was very cold, but we're like, look, it's Snow White, we're in the snow, it's so funny and ironic, I can't feel my face. <laughs> I can feel my face with I'm with you. <laughs> and on that topic, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and on that topic, we're gonna go to our next question, which is, what is a coaster that you miss the most? Like a coaster that you rode, and now it's defunct, and you're like, well, that sucks. I missed it. <laughs> Santa, waiting you for you, one? bud. Yeah, it's your turn. You're waiting for me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, honestly, there is none. Really? That I rode and that I, that's no longer there. Okay, you get an extra like, pass. You're allowed to choose something you didn't ride. Well, there is one that I rode and I didn't r- ride. And that's Space Mountain de la Terre à la Lune oh, in wow. Disneyland Space Paris. Yeah. I remember my dad thing. going on when I was there and there was still a walkway into the Space Mountain section where you could watch the the ride and at that time i was terrified so i was like i'm not going on this but now of course i regret it very much and i think i wasn't even tall enough yet but i i really want to ride it because space mount mission 2 and then everything from my what i hear from the original one it was okay hyperspace was an improvement for me like you have uh, a lot of nice effects with the lasers going on and in, with the inversions. But uh, I'm hoping that they will bring back the original one, as many fans are hoping for as well. Yeah, that's the reversal. new train design could suggest it, but we'll see. That's awesome. What's yours, babe? Um, my most, I think, of all the coasters that I've ridden, that are now demolished. I think my favorite is uh, the Georgia Cyclone. I don't have any bitterness over it being turned into Twisted Cyclone because that's a great ride in its own right. Like uh, we've ridden, we've ridden like almost a dozen of those the, the RMC Iron Horses, and uh, like while I feel that they're all starting to become formulaic, they're very like derivative of each other. Um, Twisted Cyclone I like because it doesn't really overstay its welcome. It's the shortest one. Um, they didn't try to do more than they should have. Uh, it doesn't run out of gas at the end. Some of them, like Storm Chaser and like Medusa Steel Coaster, some of them like definitely. I don't know if it's the wheels they run or what. They just kind of they kind of just meander back into the station after a pretty intense ride to begin with. But um, Twisted Cyclone doesn't do that. It's just very simple. It's like twenty six hundred feet long. Um, 
I know people were fighting to have that third lap. You know, all the Cyclone clothes are a three-lap ride. Uh-huh. And uh, there were people that were, you know, personally offended that it only was a two-lap reconfigure. But I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's just right. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's different. It does some stuff that um, the other, some of the uh, earlier RMCs haven't done. Um, so as much as I miss the old version, and, and like that, the, after coming around the second... The second turnaround, the drop off of the second turnaround in the back seat was just one of the craziest airtime moments ever. Like it'll literally, it'll put you in your friend's lap if your if your lap bar isn't as far mm-hmm. down as it possibly can be. Um, but you know, maintaining wooden coasters in the southeast is hard and it's expensive, and humidity is is not a friend of of wooden coasters. So mm-hmm. I don't. I, and the ridership for it was not good, considering it was right at the front of the park and it never really had much of a line. Was just kind of an indicator that they were not getting out of it what they could with that space. So people were skeptical mm-hmm. about whether or not it would even be a good idea or worth the effort, um, you know, independently of whether or not people really wanted it to happen. I, it was my favorite ride at that park, but I, I, I'm not, I don't mind that it happened because it's a good ride and they're, and they're, they're taking advantage of, of the space and, you know, the potential. It's exactly what uh, the Iron Horse coaster should be, which is, you know, taking problematic expensive to maintain wooden coasters, particularly ones from like the Din Din Summers and like Bill Cobb kind of era of oversized wooden coasters and making them into uh, a star attraction for the park, something that really takes advantage of the space they occupy. And especially when you have one as like the front of your park, you know, it's the first thing you see when you drive up now is this beautiful uh, blue and silver uh, RMC. Like, you you know, as much as I miss the old one, I'm, I'm perfectly content with the replacement and it's a great ride now on that topic Nick is the only one that's written both Steel Vengeance which is like obviously the biggest production when it comes to any RMC yeah and it's written the smallest little RMC yeah what do you think well like the difference of what, you, what would you describe like so I was actually really impressed with uh, what Twisted Cyclone packed in its small footprint like that ride is just almost non-stop intensity like every element just like there's no room to breathe between them so I was really impressed with that. Whereas, I mean, still Vengeance too. It's it's nonstop elements, but there's at least you know a little bit of downtime in between some. Like you have that big course break run that runs through, and then um, a little bit after the I think it's called the Twisting Snake Dive, where that's well, not before the big course break run. But yeah, so creative. It's, <laughs> <laughs> there's just uh, I don't know. It's hard to compare because they they are so different, but. Yeah. It's really impressive what RMC can do, and even when you have a smaller ride, they can still make it make it something impressive. Yeah, because like pulling up, because I always considered Joker and Discovery Kingdom to be like the smaller RMC, and actually pulling up to Sick as Over Georgia and then seeing the seeing towards the cycle, and I was like, well, this thing is particularly small. <laughs> yeah. And like when you're actually on it, it just kind of reminds you of how terribly small it is. But then the, the elements they managed to put in there, it creates a really really unique kind of ride, which. I always kind of feel like it's hard to ask some RMC to create something really unique because you're limited to wooden structure, you're going to copy elements everyone loves, but that thing does does some cool stuff. Now, Nick, what is your actual like, roller coaster that you miss? Uh, definitely Son of Beast. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, the one I miss the most is, uh, is Dragon, Dragon Challenge or Dueling Dragons. I really do miss when it dueled. Mm. Uh, that was... If I was into taking photos back when I was dueling, I, I really wish I could have taken a lot of cool shots of that, just because there were so many iconic like moments that you could you could get. Um, and plus, those inverts were really intense. They were. I remember fire being my first invert and coming off that ride dizzy. And you you walk out of that exit hallway and like a it's like a pitch black hallway almost, and just <laughs> stumbling through. You know, like, <laughs> like wow, that was what did I just get off of? So I, I really miss those two rides. Uh, they they really complement each other well. They were. They were great. That's awesome. Yeah, so for, for me, the coaster I missed the most, I guess, um, it will be Cop Car Chase, or I guess it open as Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon. Yeah, so Warner Brothers yeah. of the New World, Warner Bros., you know, Movie Park Germany, had this really cool, too good for this world, racing, intimate, looping coasters, and I didn't really think much of it when I was younger. I just kind of thought it was, um, you know, it was, it was a scary coaster for a kid, but in general, I didn't realize how special that ride was, um, because mm-hmm. it was my home park. So uh, we rode that in, on a school trip, and uh, it was pretty exciting, especially when the fire effects ran over the trains. I was, it was all pretty impressive to me, even though I do realize, in, in, you know, in retrospect, that it may have not been the best-kept coaster. 
But I went and actually removed it, and I started like becoming more involved in the Kozuki community. I really kind of felt bad that it was gone because it got replaced by a cheap copy of the Santa Monica Pier that's not at all like the Santa Monica Pier. And <laughs> it was just, I don't know, I, I feel like maybe if, if they held on to Cop Car Chase a little bit longer, they put a little bit of money into it, even though they were having financial issues, I think it would have been a coast that appreciated in value. But, you know. Ironically, that was literally what, like, what Knott's Berry Farm was trying to achieve with Windjammer Surf Racers. Like, Cop Car Chase was the successful version of that. Yep, Intamin. Like, a couple, mm. like, two small coasters. They each, eight, like, each coaster sat eight people per train, and it had a nice, you know, vertical loop and some interaction. Yep. Cop Car Chase had barrel rolls, didn't it? Yep, two barrel rolls, barrel rolls. one towards each other. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That was a neat ride. I think the moral to the story is that, like, Racing coasters, dueling do coasters, <laughs> dueling coasters are often an overspeculation of a park's uh, pull and finances because I feel like more. I think like there are more dueling and racing coasters that have been demolished than um, than are currently like still operating because it's they're expensive and it's hard to convince a park from like a marketing standpoint that you need two identical or virtually identical rides of the same of the same caliber because that's that's really what i think like what the downfall was with dueling dragons was um you already had a, a, an amazing major thrill coaster in the form of hulk at the front of the park you take virtually the most high capacity thrill coaster ever built and put it in the back of your park um of course lines and stuff and capacity were you know it just didn't it just wasn't a good balance and ultimately they're like well we really didn't need three of these incredibly narrow uh, niche like niche coasters of like well like you have to be 54 inches to ride all of these and like people with you know weaker constitutions are not going to be that into them and then for doing dragons to for there to be two of them it's like it, it's kind of like well you wouldn't expect a park to need like two batman clones i feel like it was much more of a like, because I, mean, I feel like i was much more of like well we can so yeah we do. they did it because they could but then I don't think enough thought was put into like needing the capacity, needing to yeah to the general public exactly the same ride. It's like we went the year it opened. We went in the summer of 1999, and they were walk-ons. They could not fill the trains. They were running three trains each. Wild. I mean, yeah, literally, yeah, six. Did trains. they have two stations unloading yeah. and loading? Well, no, 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 no. They had. They did. No, they, they they had disembarkment stations. Mm-hmm. I don't remember that. Yeah, because yeah. remember on the topic we were talking about like Hulk needing one, and then we're thinking, well, they don't really usually do that. But I guess dragons had them. Yeah, it was that ride was a capacity marvel. But the fact that like a, a major Orlando operation couldn't fill the trains, like nobody could. It was, I mean, everything about that ride was so enigmatic and so hard to believe that it was built. And part of the reason of why it was hard to believe that it was built is because it probably shouldn't have been like from a budgeting standpoint it didn't as from an enthusiast standpoint it's like oh my god this ride's a gift and then it closes and everyone's like what the hell like how could you do this to this ride but it, honestly like it was a, a financial misstep from the very beginning and if anything uh jk rowling didn't want that coaster yeah, around but not. it was such a great place yeah. to stuff people when harry potter opened yeah. because it's not a very large land and you're gonna open one of the most successful theme park lands in the world you better have a dueling six train inverted coaster to push people into yeah. the queue. It's funny how like that ride mm-hmm. really came into its own ten years after it debuted. I think it would have been gone sooner if it weren't for Potter. Yeah. And on yeah. that topic, everyone that misses dueling dragons, I completely get your pain. I, or at least Alex These definitely my, will. This, and Nick will. Or my first I feel pain. I yeah. Feel pain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nick. Oh, sad. <laughs> but to be fair, I mean, it was consolation. That was going to go at some dead. point when they stopped doing them. Honestly, I don't even blame Universal or J.K. Rowling. I blame the Florida law. I, I blame <laughs> the public and loose article culture. And it's no coincidence mm-hmm. that like the smartphone era happened, and suddenly like you can't have rides that duel in that capacity because people got hurt. People mm-hmm. were either deliberately throwing things at each other or losing them out of their pockets, losing their phones, losing their keys. They become projectiles and. So the way I see it, like, Dueling Dragons was just, it was too good for this world. Like, people could not, it was, it was too divine for, for, uh, for humans, mere humans, um, to, to enjoy because we ruined it and <laughs> we took the greatest thing about that ride, the dueling aspect. Once that was gone, I think a lot of people agree that once they stopped dueling, they stopped really being special. And then, so it was only a matter of time 
before that like, anyone who was surprised that was that they were demolished wasn't paying attention to the ride's timeline of of pitfalls and you know losing everything that was special about it when they lost when the Harry Potter thing happened and they lost that queue well the new queue incred- I mean the new the queue, people liked yeah. the new queue but the original queue was just I mean it was stupid how incredible it was there was it was like its own attraction walking through like the big the the big uh, knights at the round table thing and the like all of the horsemen frozen into the ceiling and, and the dungeons that's like floor to ceiling bones and skulls and I mean it was so over the top and it was almost it was kind of a pity because the ride never had a line so you would never have to stay and like wait in that themed queue it was always you just kind of walk through it but people would walk slowly. Because there was so much just to see. There was a church. There was like a whole, like a cathedral with with stained glass windows, and there was like a a, a book, like a tome at, at the altar that was like kind of sounds like a Harry Potter queue. I mean, like, it was so like, so mm. over the top. So that was like the first strike, and that was lost. The second strike, of course, was like no more dueling. And by that point, it was mm-hmm. like I didn't even like we we could have gone and ridden it. We definitely were considering to fly out just to, to ride, ride it before it, before it, before it got demolished, but. I mean, for me, I'm like, I don't, I, I never wrote it as Dragon Challenge. My first trip to Harry Potter Land, Orlando, was last month. Like, <laughs> my, my prior visit to Universal was 2006, when Dragons was still completely intact, and, like, that's how I wanted to remember it. So I kind of left it up to Sean, and then Sean was, you were kind of just, like... I mean, we already had some other trips planned. It just didn't feel like rushing and non-dueling Dragon Challenge. Mm-hmm. When I had other options to go other places, so um, I actually personally never got to ride it, just like you, Sven. But knowing the backstory, I just yeah, sad I didn't ride it, but I just don't feel that that particular about not having gotten on it, especially not because my time riding it would have been non-racing. And I'm honestly mm-hmm. quite excited that Universal is managing because I wasn't sure if Harry Potter was going to stick or how long it was going to stick. But the fact that they're able to replace Dragon Challenge with a new family launch coaster with, you know, drop tracks and spikes and all that kind of stuff. The shoe allow itself to actually be, be better themed, which Dragon Challenges wasn't up to the, you the know... Sight lines, the sightlines were terrible. weren't matching for Potter. Because you would crest mm-hmm. the lifts, and it was, you would, all you would see was the back lot. You're on the gas station, right? Yeah, it yeah. was not... I, there was a high school, you know, right next to ice, like on the... Uh, uh, <laughs> no, right next to fire, like, on, like going over that first Immelman. Oh, drove by like a high school. Field, your like, life. it was just not... It's like coming over the top of Accelerator. And expecting to see something pretty, and it's not. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Anaheim, but it's not. It's not the Lost Buena Continent Park. either. Like it's, it's just that was. Even when I was a kid, like I'm doing Dragons Open when I was eight, and we went. And I, even as a kid, I was already a jaded coaster enthusiast. And I'm like, oh, this is all so beautiful. The theme is great. And then you, but then you get up to the top of Dragons, you crest the lift, and it's just back lot. It's all the stuff that you ride through when you're going on the Hogwarts train. That of course they're deliberately uh, like obscuring your view of because they don't want to see it. They don't want people to see it. Well, that's why the new Potter coaster will be like the perfect fit. Yeah. Not only is Harry Potter a little, you know, I mean, people grew up with Harry Potter, but I find that the franchise to be very allowing for families, and therefore the new coaster will be more allowing for that. And I just think that mm-hmm. the, you know they kind of have a shot at, at redeeming themselves because dragons were very loved. So I'm excited to see where they're going with that. And then on that topic, they're opening. A new dress bar coaster, and what year was it, Nick? That they're planning? Uh, according to the report, it said 2020 or 2021. But That's yeah, that looks I wouldn't be surprised exciting. if they tried to get that open before Guardians or Tron. Just so right, well, they've well, already just, started clearing land just behind to the Discovery Center, so they're getting there. So Nick, what exactly can we expect of that coaster? Um, so according to the layout posted recently, uh, WFTV posted one, and uh, Orlando Park Stop posted one as well. Um, it looks like a, a multi-launch uh, intimate coaster with uh, a lot of like twisty spaghetti bits at the beginning, and then a launch out towards the water, um, up towards maybe a top hat, and then into another like maybe a helix over towards the Potter section, and then racing back over the water into the station. It looks uh, looks like it could be really exciting. I'm, I'm very excited. Is it multi-launch? Uh, yeah, it looks like there's two launches. Any versions? Probably. Um, all we've seen. It looks the, like an uh, animal, that, after that first launch, it, it kind of. From up in the air, it almost looks like a half loop. Yeah, yeah, complete Talon vibe. So I can like completely see like instead of like there's the steampunk dragon or whatever is exactly on Talon. Mm-hmm. I can like, I can see like a philosopher themed themed Jurassic World. It's more like a medieval type of yeah medieval monster. Type. There you go. <laughs> no one knows what it really yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. So we're excited for that coaster. 
But it looks like the Orlando market is really starting to, uh, or like the, the South of Florida market, rather, is really starting to fire up. It's the coast of war again, all over again, guys. Yeah. Twenty years later, mm-hmm. nineteen ninety nine two point oh. Got like six coasters but so, in the next couple of years. It's crazy. Yeah. So basically, the 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 Harry Potter coaster would be more the family launched, yeah, and then the. Jurassic Park, more the thrill launch. Yeah, yeah that's what it kind of seems. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of seems. And people are already asking. And like, then Jurassic is going to be really similar, and they're like, we don't. I don't yeah. Think so I think. Well, I think a Jurassic Park will be more like a like a one stop <laughs> motor launch coaster, fast action packed kind of thing. It's yeah. where Harry Potter is going to try and tell a story. Yeah. You're going to make stops. You're going to have drop tracks. You're going to have a lot of lot of little effects. You know, it's going to be a roller coaster, but it's going to be not themed to one. It's going to be pretty, like, yeah, it's going to tell the story. It's going to be the third installment in, you know, Forbidden Journey. And just like how Gringotts, Escape from Gringotts is kind of a coaster, incidentally. It doesn't do a mm-hmm. whole lot of coastery bits, but it does. It's a coaster system because that's what made the most sense thematically. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but, and then I would say that the Harry Potter coaster will be more coaster like than, than Gringotts. It already appears to be. Because um, you're outside and there's you know there's lots of turns and they're adding a lot of trees, so I'm really really looking forward to it being, um, you know, sightline friendly. Yeah. Because <laughs> and we, I expect the Jurassic Park coaster to be pretty unapologetic in its coasteriness. Like it, this is a coaster that's a coaster, and it's it's doing coaster. And we're not we're not going to try to distract you from the fact that it's a roller coaster because you know. For and then the end, at the end of the day, just how to do it at Universal Japan. Yeah. The Jurassic World or Jurassic Park, it is at the end of the day, it's a theme park. So yeah. they put coasters mm-hmm. in there, and in, and in Japan yeah. too, like the theme of a flying fly dinosaur, dinosaur is. It's a dinosaur themed coaster. Yeah, guests get That's experience the flying yeah. under a dinosaur. Here's a prototype dinosaur flying machine. Go yeah. fly it. Which is literally the roller it's like coaster. So, it's great. So I'm pretty sure they can do the it's exact same funny. thing here and be like, oh, this is a prototype Velociraptor experience. Yeah. Go ride it. Yeah, here's a roller coaster, Velociraptor coaster themed to a Velociraptor coaster. <laughs> and apologetic. Yeah. Would it also be Intamin? Yeah. Yeah. That's well, it's starting to feel like Intamin is doing all these package deals because then a um, company that's Alps, if I pronounce it correctly, mm-hmm. is um, is getting the roller coaster, the hyper coaster of Alba Belgium, the, the motor launch coaster, coaster at Parkhouse Park 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 Oh, yeah. And then the family Finally. coaster at uh, Futuroscope. So I feel like they're starting to build these package deals because they're pretty big in Asia now, but I feel yeah. like they were kind of quiet on, on the Western front for a little bit. Yeah. So I'm excited to see. There was see. a huge gap. You know, there were no Intamin coasters like between Skyrush, Skyrush, and Jet Re- or Wave Rescue or whatever it's called. The Wave Breaker. Book. Wave Breaker at um, Knee Breaker. S- <laughs> Knee Breaker. <laughs> Spirit Breaker at um, at Sea World San Antonio. I hate that ride. Just in case you guys were wondering, because the restraints are really uncomfortable and it makes me feel like my kneecaps are going to explode. Um, but that was a five-year gap between Intamin coasters in the West because pretty much every, like, Six Flags was like, we're not working with them anymore. Intamin, is, or, um, Cedar Fair was like, we're not working with them anymore after, after, like, you know, struggles with Shoot the Rapids and Intimidator. Uh, even Bush Gardens, after the issues they were having with Falcon's Fury, and, you know, they were like, okay, we're not going to work with them for a while. They only took a four-year break, I guess, between rides because Falcon's Fury was 2013, mm-hmm. I think, and then they built... Wave Breaker uh, in 2017. But, but then yeah. in that Florida market, um, you know, it's not just Universal Play now. We have, like, the two major, major Vekoma coasters coming to Walt mm-hmm. Disney World. Tron is obviously Tron. But then Guardians of the Galaxy looks like it may just be their biggest coaster yet. Yeah. Bigger than Tron. It's going to be mm-hmm. long. It's, it's going to be really long. Ride. It's going to have spinning vehicles. Yeah, MK-1212 vehicles, like the modern Vekoma looping coaster vehicles, but on, ve- like, the carriages, like, they, they rotate programmed rotating yeah so even though I'll, I'm already really stoked for Tron I'm actually really excited to see what Garnsey Galaxy is going to be like because I feel like that may in the end be the better coaster Tron is very visual like it's an experience riding it's it but it's it's, yeah. it's it's quite short and then after the first first section of the ride it's kind of slow yeah. but I feel like Guardians may actually give us a run for our coaster money Kind of like Ivory Park and building their like family friendly aesthetic coaster and their unapologetic like, this is a throw coaster yeah. kind of thing. And the same thing is coming to Bush Gardens Tampa with Guazi, Guarmzi. Guarmzi. <laughs> Guarmzi. That sounds like an, uh, like an ingredient inside of Red Bull. Like Guarmzi. Guarmzi O3. Guarmzi B vitamins. Uh, yeah, and uh, Tigris. And it looks like I think this week they're going to start. Major demolition. So Nick will be there later this week to take a look. We may join, but we're not sure yet. 
Um, so we'll have an update coming on that regard. And then we also have a Tron update that was launched last week. Um, by the time you hear this, uh, go check that out. And um, where, where we actually kind of received word of is that the SeaWorld, um, Entertainment Com- the SeaWorld Parks Entertainment Company is going to be adding a coaster at every park in 2020. Now, I'm not sure if that includes Sesame Place. I haven't heard much of Sesame Place unless you guys have. Um, but we do know that they're looking at adding a new um, family launch coaster at SeaWorld Orlando, perhaps, and where Mango Joe's is located next to the um, Shamu Stadium. Then, of course, we're getting um, Mako, the, the B&M dive machine, at SeaWorld mm-hmm. San Diego, which will be kind of like excited. Baron. I'm excited. It'll have like the smaller trains. It won't have any fests, but we just actually um, saw a layout leaked. So we're going to talk about the layout for a quick second. So anyone listening from, from California or not from California, very interested in what Mako will be doing in San Diego. It'll be a 153 feet tall um, dive machine. No myth course brake run. So it's going to, the moment it drops, it's going gonna, it's gonna to run its way back to the station. Uh, what it'll start doing is that it has now a hanging drop like the most. You get a nice turn over the top of the, the lift, kind of mm-hmm. take a view of the area. Almost a perfect 180 turn around. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually quite interesting. It's, it's more of a turn than most of the, uh, the dive machines. Then you have your, your usual typical straight down dive, 150 feet. Uh, followed by an Immelman. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like... Standard little, stuff. I feel like literally every single dive machine does that. Yeah. Except for <laughs> Oblivion. Except for Oblivion. <laughs> Oblivion, it's a dive and then the ride's over. Dive and brake run. <laughs> <laughs> dive straight through the brake run. Just drop into the station. <laughs> um, so after the Immelman, you're going to go up and um, go into a hammerhead element. So kind of like a sideways stall high in the air. And you're going to clear some track that's going to run below you. And after that, you're going to hit a bottom, kind of like a trough. Um, on the side of the ride, it doesn't seem to have a splash anywhere. But after the trough, you're gonna hit a barrel roll, roll, which becomes a turn. It's kind of like how the barrel roll in Don Robin works. Yeah. Like you have a barrel roll, and in the end, the barrel roll is kind of like a turn, like a helix. Um, that turn um, becomes a flat spin. I haven't even seen that term in a long time. But yeah. it becomes a flat spin, like a corkscrew. Yeah. So it already has three major inversions. Yeah, and when then B&M first came hmm. out, like all like their inverts and stuff, like they always called them flat spins like yeah Batman you know exactly yeah so I'm imagining and have corkscrews that flat spins yeah so rather than like the zero G rolls which are pretty popular on the smaller models it's gonna have a flat spin instead which is a, it's like a, it's really a drawn out um, big corkscrew through the layout after which you have another really highly banked turn kind of in the sky which runs as a drop into the brake run so I think it's gonna be a really really cool ride that's some that's some new things and I'm also kind of excited it doesn't have a mid course brake run because the best part about this ride is it has regular shoulder harnesses and not those as horrible, far as we know now, horrible yeah. vests. Mm-hmm. As far as we're being told, so that's cool. And it's gonna be located right next to Durant to Atlantis, so it'll be uh, the location of the park is perfect. And uh, yeah, it'll be right when you come into the parking lot. Like it's it'll just be right there, the, ho- the new hood ornament for the park. Yeah, so of course we're getting Guarum C at um, Bush Gardens in 2020. Bush Gardens mm-hmm. Tampa. This is Bush Gardens Williamsburg is either adding a the hyper style coaster, perhaps Giga or a uh, multi launch coaster like we're seeing in Park Asterix. Mm-hmm. It's kind of rumors at this point yeah. that nothing has been really been, been released, but they have a lot of um, hillside to play with. And Nick's gonna go on his first visit, I think, this year. Hopefully, yeah. Ooh. So like he'll he'll see like it's just the rivers running through the they park have a far lot of below room to work with, and they, still with inside like within the train the train circumference because yeah. they still have that huge huge gap where Dragon Fire. And technically, was. the park is the largest park in the chain, even though Tampa feels yeah. larger because it's better developed. And then uh, San Antonio, I can't believe the park is honestly still around. <laughs> um, <laughs> Seaworld San Antonio is going to get, uh, it looks like a GCI Woody, GCI 100 Woody, feet tall. Which is what Fiesta Texas mm. almost got. Yeah, and so, now SeaWorld is like, well, we're going to prove that this was what you should have built. So most of this is semi-confirmed rumors, but of course Mako is, is the real deal. So we're really, really excited for that. Because whoever thought that SeaWorld San Diego was going to be a coaster park? Yeah. I got no clue. They're adding, uh, adding a bunch of coasters. And there's, there's even talk of another coaster the year after, but that's for another episode. Don't forget about Tidal <laughs> Twister. Oh, Tidal Twister. That's supposedly going to happen. Totally still. crazy sanity. <laughs> Tidal Twister. Uh, Harley Quinn's Gravy Train, or whatever it's called, at um, Discovery Kingdom. Like, that ride is AWOL. All I, hear I wouldn't be surprised now, if they like took they, the loss on the thing. They've taken it. like the trains apart. There's like harnesses and stuff that, like, according to the, my little friends on Instagram that I follow up in the north northern California area, they all keep me abreast of like what's happening with that ride because it seems to change on a daily basis. Um, but like <laughs> the the trains are like taken apart and the rides get down and, pe- and apparently like people don't even miss it. No one's asking about it. The general public doesn't seem to care. I also don't care. 
Is the park's a lot quieter. Now, something I do care to ride, <laughs> something I do care to ride is Fly at Fantasialand, but um, Sven was just mm. there like a couple of days ago. What does it look like? Is it going to open this year, you think, or we're going to have to wait? I, uh, well, what we, what I saw was that the side from, um, the Wizard Town area, so the, Wizard more like Town. the children area and the indoor area where you have the two windjas, yes. uh, that side is completely and the finished. the paddle tree. <laughs> yeah. That's right. No kidding. <laughs> That's such a fun thing. Um, and then on the other side in the Berlin street, you have the Rockburg entrance. So... It's getting really hard to see something from inside the park. The only uh, spot left is at the entrance of Mauser Chocolat. Ooh. And there you see Charming that they are that. also building steel structures. So it will be hard to catch up on, on what they are building. But uh, from what we saw is that most... There seems to be already a lot of track up a fly. But they released the hotel plans... And basically, I think there is nothing yet built from the hotel. So, I think they want to open an area, Rookburg, with not only the flying coaster, but also with the hotel and maybe another ride for the kids or families, because... Well, was I hearing it was a, a theater going to be added to the area? Yeah, the rumor has it that the Fantasma... Uh, theater uh, would be located in the Rookburg area so that that way the the existing theater would be uh, free and then the next step would be to have the Hollywood tour, the Temple of the Nighthawk, uh, I mean Temple of the Lift Hill and um, <laughs> Sven, it was a and the Fantasma uh, <laughs> theater built into something new so sweet. Oh. Temple of the Lift Hill. <laughs> yeah. If anyone hasn't been on a ride, it is, um, it is exceptionally long. It is a really long Vacoma indoor coaster. It is a kind of slow, but there, there's three lift hills. And everyone was telling me prior to my first ride that like by the time you get to the third lift hill, you wish it was over because it's yeah. so boring. And I was like, no, <laughs> no way in hell. Is any Vacoma going to be too boring for me? Third lift hill comes. I'm like, over it. Over it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's better be a lift yeah, back to the station. I wrote, it, Express. <laughs> I wrote it last time. And there were two kids a few rows in front of me with their flash oh. on all the time. So that made it even worse. I prefer it in the dark. <laughs> that way that you have is. some sense of speed. It used to um, be like a space ride, like Space Mountain yeah. themed, and then they turned. Then space they like, Center. They, they very like gin, like they they very uh, uh, like just kind of haphazardly rethemed it to Temple of the Nighthawk when the Woos yeah. land came. So it's like very clearly you're in this spaceship that has been painted green, and they put a bunch of fake plants in the ceiling. And it is so not fantastic. It is not what Fantasia no. business model is all about anymore, which is why that ride is like they've yeah. been cleaning house on all of their old stuff. Geister rickshaw. Is also is it done forever now, Sven? There are strong rumors, indeed, that it would that today was the last day that the park was open uh, this season. So it might have been the last ride for many people. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised because there's this one scene where there's a huge boat. With that's one of the best scenes in there because the boat is moving, and then in the boat there are also animatronics. Mm -hmm. But it was standing still, oh. so they didn't even bother to fix it. Oh. Is that a sign? I don't know. But there are also strong rumors that it will be closed. Uh, but coming back to Rookburg and Fly, I'm doubting that it will open this year. I hope it will. But uh, if they do so, then it will be at the end of the year, doing like a kind of what Europa Park did with Eurosat Can Can Coaster, like a late, uh, late season opening. But I, seeing what still needs to be done, hmm, I think it will be 2020. It's actually good information to have because I personally, uh, Alex and I, were kind of planning on planning on going on a on a Europe trip with fly in mind. But uh, that's definitely like I'm not going to rush to Europe anytime soon when it comes to comes to riding that. Yeah. And if anyone's making plans to go to Europe for for theme parks soon, be aware to fly is very likely not going to be open for your trip this year. So. Yeah, that's good. If you've never been to Fantasia Land, it's still worth going. Go. But it may be a little oh, salty yeah. when you see like fly. It'll still be like your day will be filled to the brim with lift hills. With no kidding. <laughs> 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 All right, your day will be busy. Uh, 
at Fantasyland. Pretty sure it's never the only been. park in the world that has two roller coasters that have three lift hills. Uh, Disneyland. Hello. Which which Disneyland? Oh, well, Disneyland Big itself. Mountain and Space Mountain. Because Space Mountain has, has three five, four lift hills. Okay. <laughs> That's true. Okay, well, Sorry I about stand your corrected. All righty. <laughs> we covered all of our topics for today. Yeah, so this is kind of like an introduction episode. We're gonna um, we're gonna have a season of about twelve episodes uh, every month. Towards the end of the month, you can accept, uh, expect an episode to come out. Um, in the future, we're gonna talk about a little bit more serious stuff, um, news. We're gonna have a special episode just kind of on Asia because we have juicy Universal Studios Beijing plans. We're gonna talk juicy. about juicy, mm. juicy, <laughs> whatever juicy is in Chinese. And then <laughs> juicy, juicy, juicy in China. Yeah. Ooh, that's my dog. Okay. And then um, we're gonna do some uh, some first days. We're gonna talk a little bit about Disney um, and all their parks because we like Disney uh, quite a bit. And so we really, really thank you guys for listening to our first episode. If you have any questions, shoot us um, shoot an email at info at thecoastkings.com. Visit us on the web the coast the coast of we have social media for region specific, Florida, Europe, California. And miscellaneous. And miscellaneous. Cabin crew, Mr. <laughs> Kings. So go ahead and uh, give us a follow. And we would look forward to listening to you guys again. And, or actually, uh, you guys yeah, listening to I, us I, again, I, I should say. And yeah. if you have any ideas for topics, uh, we are always, uh, our ears are open. We would love to talk about mm-hmm. things that you guys want to hear about. So. And we are definitely going to do some uh, some major giveaways um, with some cool theme park merch, some, yeah. some special defunct ride stuff that we have access to because we want to make sure that you, but not only you, also other people listen to our podcast. So uh, go ahead and spread the word. We'll have several, uh, several giveaways um, involving social media shares coming up. So uh, please share the podcast with anyone you love because you love us as well, I think, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.